Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this week's virtual journal club. My name is JP Brito, I'm an endocrinologist at Mayo Clinic and co-host of this virtual series. This morning, we are honored to have Dr. Kristen Coppoli, and, and she will be discussing the, her recent publication about the role of microcalcifications in the, in the risk assessment for thyroid nodules. Dr. Coppoli is an assistant professor of clinical medicine at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine. Dr. Coppoli's medical exp expertise includes the management of thyroid disorders with an emphasis of thyroid neoplasia, thyroid cancer, and thyroid disease in pregnancy. She collaborates on research with her most recent work focusing in the sonographic predictors of malignancy in thyroid nodules. She's also the author of several published book chapters on thyroid disease. As an expert discussant, we have the pleasure to have Dr. Jabad Atsadi, is the chief of the ultrasound of Joe Hawkins and is an assistant professor in the Department of Radiology. He regularly interprets thyroid ultrasounds and performs ultrasound guided thyroid nodule fine needle respiration biopsy as part of his everyday clinical practice. He also participates as a lead radiologist at the monthly Geoff Hawkins Thyroid Tumor Conference alongside endocrinologists, head and neck surgeons, oncologists, radiologists, oncologists, and pathologists. So uh, we have um, um, the pleasure to have these fantastic speakers, and I will turn it over to you, Dr. Kavali, uh, for the first talk. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for having me. And can you just confirm that you see the same slide I do? So it's the um, picture of me and um, Dr. Azadi in pink. <laughs> yes, um, I'm seeing that one, and I'm also seeing the next slides a version of the presentation. You see my presenter view. Um, let me I, let me just have one second here and try to do this correctly. Then. Yep, that's fine. Oh, you you can click the swap uh, view too as well in that. Uh, how is it? Yeah, now? perfect. Now it's perfect. Right, yes. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me this morning. I'm really looking forward to this opportunity to present our work. I'm going to highlight our recent paper, which was published in Thyroid, which is entitled Macrocalcifications Do Not Alter Malignancy Risk Within the American Thyroid Association Sonographic Pattern System When Present in Non High Suspicion Thyroid Nodules. The title is sort of a mouthful as I'm saying it out loud. Um, my co authors are Dr. Caroline Kim from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, division of Endocrinology, Dr. Joe Langer, who's in our Radiology Division, and Susan Mandel from Endocrinology. We have no relevant financial disclosures, although I do want to um, just uh, mention that Dr. Mandel is one of the authors on the American Thyroid Association Nodule Guidelines, and Dr. Langer is an author on the ACR TIRADS Guidelines. So we have lots of interest in our health system and comparing and contrasting the differences in these um, classification systems. I'm going to just briefly go through the framework for this morning's talk. Um, first, this is probably knowledge that everyone has, but I do want to contrast the two major risk stratification systems for selecting thyroid nodules for FNA biopsy and just set the background stage for what we're going to be talking about in our paper. We'll talk about some of the limitations in classifying sonographic patterns within the American Thyroid Association sonographic pattern system. Um, and we call that the ATA SPS for the sake of the, our paper. We're gonna review our study, which assessed non-classifiable nodules in the ATA pattern system. And we are predominantly focusing on the handling of calcifications. And lastly, we'll talk about the strengths and limitations of applying these data in clinical practice. So some background. Um, so an incidental detection of thyroid nodules, you know, predominantly through imaging done for other purposes, has led to a very large number of biopsies. In the United States alone, almost half a million thyroid biopsies are performed, and yet we know that most thyroid nodules are in fact benign. Um, again, there are numerous risk stratification systems to define sonographic patterns and select appropriate thyroid nodules for FNA. And the goal is really to look for nodules that are a high risk of malignancy while avoiding biopsy of nodules that are, you know, based on probability, most likely benign. Um, within the United States, the most common patterns that we use are the ATA sonographic pattern system, as well as the American College of Radiology's Thyroid Imaging Reporting and Data System, or ACR TIRADS. And TIRADS is predominantly used in the radiology community. Endocrinologists, I would say, use both, but a lot of us use the American Thyroid Association system to think about nodules, and other clinicians use certainly a combination of these. And if you look at the literature, there's been studies that are assessing 
um, the number of nodules that are not able to be classified with the ATA guidelines. And this, there's a range here, but between three to 37% of these nodules have been found to be non-classifiable. And this is largely due to the handling of calcifications. Um, so I'm not gonna walk through this whole um, guideline system, but this is the ATA sonographic risk pattern um, of malignancy for those who aren't familiar. And nodules are classified um, as either being high suspicion, intermediate, low suspicion, very low suspicion, or benign, which are purely cystic nodules. And you can see within each group, there's a risk of malignancy below um, less than 1% for benign, all the way up to 70 to 90% for high suspicion nodules. And if you look at this guideline system, um, calcifications are described in two places, and this is in the high suspicion pattern of thyroid nodules. So one are microcalcifications and nodules that are solid and hypoechoic, and you can see these microcalcifications in this nodule here that's being um, shown as an example. Additionally, there are nodules that have peripheral rim calcifications that are interrupted where there's soft tissue extrusion. So tumor actually probably being viewed growing through the nodule. Um, and that again is considered a high suspicion pattern. However, within the rest of this system, there's no other types of calcifications that are addressed. Um, and I would like to point out that in very low suspicion pattern nodules, so this is an example here of a spongiform nodule, um, you are allowed to see some echogenic reflectors. So this is, for example, um, areas of posterior acoustic enhancement on the back wall of microcystic areas. And that's a benign finding and is not, not considered a calcification. Um, likewise, if we see cystic nodules that have um, comet tail artifact, that's also not considered a calcification and is allowed to be um, part of that nodule. Now, the American College of Radiology takes a slightly different approach of getting to a very similar um, outcome. They look at nodules and look at the composition. Is it solid or cystic? Echogenicity of the nodule, the shape, the margins. And then this last category is echogenic foci. And here, um, the TIRADS guidelines do add a point for nodules that have a macro calcification. They add two points if there's a peripheral rim calcification and three points for punctate echogenic foci. Once all of these um, points are added, the nodule is assigned to a risk category and there's a recommendation for biopsy or observation. And so this is a big difference between these two classification systems in the handling of calcifications. So what does the literature tell us about calcifications? Well, microcalcifications or punctate echogenic foci in nodules that are solid and hypoechoic is a well-established high-risk feature for thyroid cancer. But what about macrocalcifications? You know, data surrounding this are actually very heterogeneous. And if you look um, and kind of look in these studies, many of the studies are assessing the presence or absence of these calcifications alone without really assessing the underlying grayscale pattern of the nodule. Um, there's, I could spend you know, an hour or more just talking about calcifications and nodules, but I just wanted to highlight three um, background studies that I thought were useful um, in thinking about the work that we're going to be doing today. So the first is a study by the authors Na et al. in thyroid in 2016, and they assessed over 2,000 thyroid nodules that had cytology or surgical diagnoses. And they found that macrocalcifications were more likely to be associated with malignancy when the other grayscale features also conferred high risk. Um, when the grayscale pattern was considered, only microcalcifications were an independent predictor of malignancy in either partially cystic knowledge nodules or solid nodules that were iso or hyperechoic. Um, and interestingly, microcalcifications in solid and hypoechoic nodules had an 81% risk of cancer versus 26% when they were seen in ASO or hyperechoic solid nodules and mixed nodules. So still, still increased risk, but not to the same extent. Um, another study by Guan in the Korean Journal of Radiology in 2020 looked at over 3,000 nodules and found 1.2% of those that had isolated macrocalcifications. Um, and they found a malignancy rate of 23% in the nodules with macrocalcifications, which is high. Um, however, if you looked at the nodules, only six of them had surgical pathology that were resected. But of those, they did look at the um, ATA sonographic pattern. And 67%, four of the six were high suspicion nodules. Um, and one was 
intermediate suspicion one was low. So this distribution suggests that perhaps these calcifications, macro calcifications really didn't increase the risk beyond that that was expected by the grayscale pattern um, alone. And lastly, a study by Wildman Tobringer in radiology in 2019 looked at artificial intelligence models to analyze thyroid nodules. And they used a revised um, ACR TIRADS category known as AI TIRADS. And this used a more simplified point scale to be able to um, teach the artificial intelligence how to recognize nodules. And one of the things that were done was eliminating the point for macro calcifications. And this did not alter the diagnostic performance in this um, classifications. There were slight improved specificity and it maintained sensitivity. So our study question was, can an ATA um, sonographic pattern system risk level be assigned to nodules that have what we termed non-high suspicion calcifications just by an analysis of their underlying grayscale features alone? So what is a non-high suspicion calcification? We define these as shadowing macro calcifications, as well as punctate echogenic foci and nodules that were not hypoechoic and solid. Now, if you look at the ATA guidelines, um, you will never see the term punctate echogenic foci, although this term is used in the TIRADS guidelines. Um, and one of our reviewers had asked us about this. And the reason we chose to use the term PEF is that there was a study published that looked at the positive predictive value of punctate echogenic foci for pathologically proven somomatous or microcalcifications. It's only about 45 to 48%. Um, and in other instances, PEF reflect thick colloid or non-shadowing macro calcifications. So we decided to use the sonographic um, description of these as opposed to calling them micro calcifications. And then we also wanted to ask, are there other non-classifiable patterns in the ATA sonographic pattern system? So, you know, is there anything else that we could see that really wasn't able to be classified? So what we did was a retrospective review of 728 consecutively biopsied thyroid nodules from our endocrine practice um, between January 2014 and December 2015. Um, and we selected this two-year period because it was the period before um, the most recent ATA guidelines came about. And in this period, nodules that were mixed cystic solid and spongiform were still being biopsied. We thought this was important because certainly there's nodules that look pretty un unremarkable that are mixed cystic solid but have macro calcifications. Um, we had three blinded endocrinologists who classified nodules into a the ATA sonographic pattern system or deemed them non-classifiable. Um, and if a nodule had non-high suspicion calcifications, we documented what the grayscale pattern would be based on the classification system if the nodule had been non-calcified. And our kappa for inner observer variability showed good inner observer agreement. Um, if we weren't sure what the nodule showed, a couple of us would look at it together and come to a consensus. And we assessed the effect of assigning the ATA sonographic pattern systems risk level to nodules that have these non-high suspicion calcifications based on analyzing their grayscale features alone, and then compared the observed cytology outcomes between nodules with and without non-high suspicion calcifications. And then we also assessed the risk of malignancy in nodules that weren't classifiable. And I'll walk through all of this in more detail. Just looking at our nodules, so there were 728 of these, 80% were classifiable by the sonographic pattern system, and another 20% were unable to be classified, largely due to the presence of non-high suspicion calcifications. So 70% of our non-classifiable nodules had these calcifications. Um, we also found 30 nodules that were solid, um, but had a heterogeneous echogenicity where we couldn't determine where the intermediate low suspicion, we were unable to assess that. And so that was a, a new group. Um, and then we also found 13 nodules, so a very small number that had complete rim calcifications where you couldn't tell anything about the underlying grayscale pattern at all. So while they were calcified, they weren't able to be in our group where we were sort of reclassifying them based on their grayscale features. And I'm just going to show a few examples of nodules that we had in the paper so that you can better see how some of these things look. So this is an example of a nodule that is solid and isoechoic. It does have macro calcifications, but it also has these punctate echogenic foci. 
Um, this nodule, just for interest, was a Bethesda II with benign cytology. Um, and then here is an example of a nodule that's solid and hypoechoic. And you can see there's this large central linear macrocalcification. Um, this was a follicular neoplasm and pathology showed a benign follicular adenoma. And then this is one of our examples of, nodule, of a nodule that was solid with a heterogeneous echo texture. You can see here parts of this nodule appear more isoechoic, parts more hyperechoic. And this was a papillary thyroid cancer. And then lastly, this is an example of a completely rim calcified nodule where you can't see anything um, about the underlying grayscale pattern because it's obscured by the calcification. Now, obviously with thyroid biopsies, a large majority are going to be benign. And so we wanted to estimate the risk of malignancy within the groups that we um, have, but we had to do some estimates. And so I'm just gonna walk you through that as well. So to come up with the final malignancy rate, Whenever we had surgical pathology results, those of course were the gold standard and that was how we determined um, whether that particular nodule was benign or cancer. Um, for other nodules that didn't have surgical pathology, if they had a benign cytology, they were considered benign. Um, at this time in our institution, we were using an Affirma GEC um, on certain nodules that were Bethesda three and four. Um, we sent all Bethesda five nodules at that time that were recommended to have surgery. Um, and so Bethesda three, four nodules that had a benign Affirma test were also considered to be benign. And then lastly, for nodules that had indeterminate cytology but weren't operated on for various reasons, um, we would either use our institutional cancer rates, we have the rates of cancer within our Bethesda categories, or we would use an Affirma GEC estimate for certain Bethesda three and four nodules. And in this study, we had 12 nodules that would have been considered NIFT-P, um, and we considered them malignant for the purposes of this classification. So looking at our results, we had 728 nodules and 685 patients. They were largely female. The average age was 54, and their TSH was normal. Um, our mean nodule size was 2.5 centimeters. And overall, these were patients who were at an average risk for thyroid cancer. So only 5% had a high-risk family history and 2% had a radiation exposure at a young age. Of the 584 nodules that were classifiable by the ATA sonographic pattern system, we did look to see if they um, demonstrated the expected malignancy rates. And we saw that the malignancy rates we observed within each group um, were in accordance with those that were predicted by the ATA guidelines. And this really just validates that the ATA sonographic pattern system is working and that our, our um, findings align with that. Then we looked at the cytology outcomes by the ATA sonographic pattern system with and without the presence of non-high suspicion calcifications. And so this is our table one from the paper um, all of the nodules with non-high suspicion calcifications, their grayscale features were either ATA intermediate low or very low suspicion. So there's no high suspicion group on this table. Um, but we looked at nodules without cal calcifications and nodules with non-high suspicion calcifications. And we found no difference in the distribution of cytology outcomes between the two groups. And in fact, if you looked at the estimated cancer prevalence of nodules with non-high suspicion calcifications, um, it was 7% versus about 9% for the total group of intermediate low and very low suspicion nodules. So not a significant difference. Um, let's take a closer look at the non-high suspicion calcifications just so everyone understands what we actually saw. Um, so 92 of these, 91% were macro calcifications. These were coarse calcifications. They could have central or peripheral linear and curvilinear calcifications or non-interrupted rim calcifications that did not obscure the grayscale pattern. And of course did not have an um, extrusive soft tissue component which would have made the nodule um, an ATA high suspicion nodule. Um, only nine, so a very small number did, we saw that had these um, punctate echogenic foci in nodules that were solid and isoechoic. Um, and so these were nodules that based on their grayscale pattern alone would have fallen into the ATA low suspicion group. And these had an estimated cancer prevalence of 19% relative to 10% for the low suspicion group as a whole. Um, but this was not a statistically significant difference. 
And then, as I mentioned, we found a few other patterns. So of the nodules that were completely rim calcified, our estimated risk of malignancy in this group showed that it, it was low, 85% of these were benign. Um, and then nodules that were heterogeneously solid, 43% um, of these were benign. So actually the majority of these were malignancies. All right, so what do these findings mean? I'm gonna go through each of them and we can talk a little bit about this. Um, you know, the first is the macro calcifications, which were the overwhelming majority of our non-high suspicion calcifications did not alter the risk of malignancy within the ATA sonographic pattern system beyond what we would expect with the underlying grayscale pattern alone. Um, and this is really an important finding we thought. So it's likely reasonable to select nodules for FNA based on the grayscale features, regardless of the presence or absence of macro calcifications. Um, and this does a few things. It can simplify guidelines. Um, it also could help prevent unnecessary FNA. So one of the things that we saw that led to this work in the first place was that you would see a nodule that maybe was not as concerning, but had a macro calcification getting upgrading it in TIRADS for a bi biopsy recommendation. So we thought this was a really interesting finding. Um, we also had this finding of, again, punctate echogenic foci and non-hypoechoic nodules in a very small sample size. Um, while this wasn't a significant increase in the malignancy rate, 19% from 10%, it's probably a clinically significant difference. And when you think about the ATA guidelines and the risk of malignancy in each category, this would actually you know, make this based on 19% fall into more of an ATA intermediate suspicion pattern. Um, that's the group that has a risk of malignancy of 10 to 20%. And you know, while small sample size, this trend aligns with other risk stratification systems, um, not only the ACR TIRADS guidelines, but also EU and Korean TIRADS, which all have a lower threshold of biopsy when PEF are present in nodules um, other than non-hypoechoic solid, in non-hypoechoic solid nodules. And then we found an apparent increased malignancy rate in these solid nodules, again, with heterogeneous echogenicity. Um, and we found 30 of these, 57% were malignant. And the majority were follicular derived lesions. So these were papillary thyroid cancers that were follicular variant and then follicular and herthal cell carcinomas. And we weren't looking for this pattern. It really kind of came about by just kind of staring at these nodules and different views and not being able to figure out how to classify them. Um, but we have you know, found at least one other study where this pattern has been reported. And this is a study by um, Lauda Rabano and thyroid in 2018. And they looked at the ATA sonographic pattern system in 463 nodules that were Bethesda three and four. Um, so nodules that had already been identified as having indeterminate cytology that went on to be resected. Um, and they found um, that 37% of those were not classifiable. And that group included heterogene heterogeneous echogenicity as well, but it also included um, iso or hyperechoic so solid nodules that had one or more what they deemed suspicious features. And that group as a whole had a 36% malignancy rate. And I don't know the breakdown, um, it's not published between how many of these were heterogeneously solid versus the other features, but you know, maybe a signal here as well. So this may be an under-recognized concerning pattern um, and probably requires more investigation. Um, and then lastly, this group of rim calcified nodules that completely obscured the grayscale pattern. Again, in our study, 85% of these had benign cytology. Um, and just again, highlighting this is not interrupted peripheral calcs with extrusive soft tissue, which would be a high suspicion nodule. Um, and another study I want to highlight did not support what we found here. So again, our sample size is extremely small, but Malhi et al. in AGR in 2019 did a review of 97 peripherally calcified nodules, and 27% of these were malignant on biopsy. And this was regardless of whether the sonographic pattern was obscured or the calcifications were continue, continuous or interrupted and whether or not there was soft tissue extrusion. So different findings and suggest that maybe these are a little more worrisome than the small sample we had. Um, and I think the main thing here is to be really cautious if we start to generalize any of the findings regarding non-high suspicion calcifications it really can't apply in a situation where the grayscale features are obscured. So these nodules should not be um, you know, considered to be a non-high suspicion calc calcification. All right, so limitations of our study. This was a retrospective design, um, which of course allows for selection bias. 
Um, ultrasound interpretation is highly variable and it can be um, difficult to sometimes interpret whether something's a calcification or not. We try to make an effort to really not overcall or overread punctate echogenic foci. Um, so if we, you know, really looking to make sure that it wasn't the back wall of a cystic space, that type of thing. Um, so that's something to think about in, in looking at this study. And then generalizability is always, you know, an issue. And we had three endocrinologists who all work in a high volume academic thyroid center. So, you know, thinking about how generalizable this is um, to other clinicians is always a, a question. Um, and then again, we had a really small sample size of some of these sonographic patterns. And so, you know, being able to get some more um, nodules in some of these categories would be really valuable. So what should we take away from, from this paper? Um, our feeling is that the key findings in terms of applications to clinical practice are one, that we really should de-emphasize macro calcifications in nodules that are mixed cystic and solid or in purely solid nodules that don't have other underlying suspicious features. And so really focusing on the grayscale features and not worrying so much about a, you know, an isolated and particular macro calcification um, is what we, we would recommend. And then we also maybe need to think about lowering the FNA threshold in solid nodules that have heterogeneous echo texture. And so, you know, whether that's biopsying them at a smaller size or doing more investigation into this pattern, um, you know, th those things can be considered, but certainly this may need to heighten someone's index of suspicion that a nodule could be malignant. Um, there's certainly many goals in classifying nodules for the future. So um, larger studies investigating some of these less common ultrasound patterns could be really valuable. Um, and then continuing to modify and align the thyroid nodule risk stratification systems, I think is really important. Um, and certainly in communication with patients, it can be a little bit difficult in times where different guidelines um, suggest different things in terms of what to biopsy and what to follow. And um, you know, I think at times we even use these advanced, the guidelines, at least in my practice, I think to, to our own advantage to help um, back up what we want to do for a patient anyway. But I think having, you know, more consensus is something people are obviously working towards and would be of great benefit. All right. Well, since we're doing this virtually today um, and travel is still fairly limited, I wanted to um, show off a new um, building in our Philadelphia campus, the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania opened our pavilion in October. Um, so here's a little view from Philadelphia. Um, and I really thank you so much for the opportunity to present our work today. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing Dr. Azadi's critique and insight. Thank you. So I don't think I'm going to be able to really follow up on Dr. Bali's talk, but um, I'll do my best. Um, so fantastic um, original research. Um, my portion of this talk will be more of a review of what led to her clinical question um, and research question. And really, it's thyroid nodule macrocalcifications, why the worry? Um, I'm the chief of ultrasound here at Johns Hopkins. I'm not a thyroid researcher um, by trade, but I deal a lot with thyroid nodules and I do a lot of thyroid nodule FNA in my clinical practice. As for disclosures, I do serve on the ACR uh, practice parameter for performance and interpretation of ultrasound of the thyroid and extracranial head and neck. We are currently about to finalize our most recent version of that document. Um, so I am biased toward ACR recommendations. Um, and thankfully, I have no financial disclosures for this talk. So what are macro calcifications? What are the sonographic findings? Um, it's a very common finding in thyroid nodules. As a radiologist, the first place we typically see thyroid nodules will be incidentally on CT. Um, and it can create this cascade workup for patients. And oftentimes, you'll see these coarse uh, enlarged calcifications. Um, as a radiologist, I don't necessarily put any value to seeing calcifications on CT. Uh, you certainly can't see punctate echogenic foci or microcalcifications on CT. Um, we go more off the size of the nodule to recommend follow-up. In the era of medical transparency, patients are now able to read their own reports. They do read the reports, they read thyroid nodule. 
they go to Google and they search thyroid nodules and then they uh, invariably go down the rabbit hole. And then, you know, they, they can really make themselves think that they're going to die of thyroid cancer and it's hopeless, um, which unfortunately is maybe just due to um, inadequate communication between physicians and the patients. But uh, it's definitely a fear a lot of patients get when they read their own reports. Um, what a macrocalcification is sonographically is it's any hyperechoic foci greater than one millimeter. So it can be pretty small and it usually has posterior acoustic shadowing, which is typical for calcifications. And that's because the sound waves aren't able to travel through, um, but they may not. So if you see something greater than one centimeter, you can call it a macrocalcification. Punctate echogenic foci, which is used synonymously with microcalcifications, but as pointed out by Dr. Cavalli, it's not the same thing. It's foci that are less than one millimeter. And they may have posterior acoustic shadowing, um, but they um, it's really a size threshold. If you were to see a clear comet tail artifact, then that's a benign colloid crystal. Um, and the reason why there's this association with microcalcifications is because uh, they're thought to be the somomatous bodies in papillary thyroid carcinoma. But as it's been, been mentioned, they might reflect um, microcystic change, colloid cysts. Um, and in my experience, it can also be machine dependent. Some machines will really exaggerate edges and it'll look like calcifications, but when you scan it on a different machine, um, they blur away. And that may just be due to vendor variability and how it's presenting the images. So where did this idea that a macrocalcification is a risk factor for thyroid carcinoma? Now, obviously thyroid uh, you know, parenchyma doesn't have calcifications in it normally, at least not ones we can see. Um, and Kim et al. in 2008 wanted to answer which macrocalcifications were associated with thyroid cancer. They looked at 174 patients um, and they were able to show that, you know, solitary calcifications and eggshell calcifications were more commonly benign uh, compared to uh, coarse calcifications. Um, but overall, all three patterns were associated with malignancy. And this was pre-TIRADS, um, pre-ATA uh, 2015 and 2011. And they were using a more uh, simple approach. You know, you know, nodules were considered suspicious if they're hypoechogenic, if they were irregular margins or lobulated, or if they had taller than wide shape. Um, and nodules without any of those risk factors, but macrocalcifications, only 65.5% were benign. So taking that at face value, you would assume that, you know, approximately 35% of those nodules were malignant. Uh, and that would be a worrisome finding. When you have just one risk factor in macrocalcifications, the number of benign or the percentage of benignity drops down to 24%. And so that really kind of raises some alarm. It would be, you know, justification to say, oh, macrocalcifications are worrisome. But what this doesn't do is it doesn't really go beyond saying, okay, is it coarse or solitary eggshell? And so more work has to be done. In 2014, Arpachi et al. reviewed the malignancy for macrocalcifications in 907 patients. And so they split it into eggshell parenchymal. Um, and they were, again, similar results. Eggshell calcifications were benign and 70%. Um, compared to 80% without macrocalcifications. Um, and the malignancy rate was fairly low, 1.9% versus 0.8%. Um, they had suspicious um, pathology, 7.5% versus 1.9%. And then non-diagnostic was higher, 22.7% versus 17% without calcification. Uh, parenchymal calcifications in general were benign, a little higher rate, 76.3%. Um, but more of them were malignant, 3.8% uh, versus 0.8% without, suspicious and 5.2% versus 1.9% without, and then non-diagnostic, uh, it was actually a lower yield compared to nodules without calcifications. Uh, this was a paper followed up with by Park et al. in 2014, um, and this was which sonographic features when combined with macrocalcifications are associated with thyroid? cancer. And this is, I think, an important paper um, that was used to shape the ATA guidelines, um, and it is used to shape kind of clinical practice. So they were looking at calcification thickness, interruption of the calcification, presence of a soft tissue rim outside of the calcification, uh, 
um, as well as looking in the grayscale features, you know, the shape, the margin, composition, echogenicity, internal vascularity, as well as the background parenchymal echogenicity. And they were to, they were able to find that if there was an irregular thickness to the calcification, that that greatly increased the risk of malignancy. Uh, and an interrupted calcified rim also greatly increased the risk of malignancy. And then if there was a malignant soft or rather, if there was a soft tissue rim, similarly also increased the risk of malignancy. Um, if you look at what the odds ratios were for these calcifications and grayscale features, um, intuitively would think taller than wide would be a very high risk factor, right? Thyroid nodules should grow with the parenchyma, not against it. Uh, whereas cancers would grow through the planes uh, that was only associated with 1.7. Uh, irregular margins, 2.7. Um, irregular thickness of the calcification, 7.1. Interrupted calcification, 4.9. And then soft tissue around 3.1. And I guess if you think about it from a pathophysiology perspective, you know, the body's trying to encapsulate this abnormal nodule with calcification, but then the malignancy has uh, outpaced the calcification is now starting to break through. And that might be represented uh, with those sonographic findings. Uh, this paper was reviewed, but not all in 2016, uh, looked at solitary macrocalcifications, and they looked at patients undergoing both FNA and core biopsy. So uh, it was only 44 patients. And for most practitioners, they don't routinely do core biopsy, even if it's calcified. Um, I've only been asked to do it once. Um, but it was a case where the patient had repeated non-diagnostic FNA for calcified nodule. And um, the decision was, if it was benign, then they would do a hemithyroidectomy versus if it was malignant, they would do total thyroidectomy. And so the, the clinical information would be very helpful for guiding management. Um, in this case, uh, the work showed that core biopsy had a higher diagnostic yield compared to FNA for calcified nodules. Um, and it was 6.5% non-diagnostic versus almost 62% for FNA. Atypia was seen in 5.1% of core biopsies versus 10%. So again, you are now at that suspicious diagnosis versus definitely malignant versus definitely benign. Um, and you were seeing higher rates of malignancy with core biopsy, you know, almost 10% versus 5% for FNA. Um, and interestingly enough, for the non-diagnostic FNA, 13 of those cases, 23% uh, of those were malignant, so it's a core biopsy. Uh, and then these authors also noted that the lobulated contour and disruption of calcification were both associated with malignancy. Um, so this might be, are we underestimating the risk of malignancy with FNA of calcified nodules? And that's, that's a potential consideration. So in 2015, the American Thyroid Association took you know, all that preceding literature, uh, as well as kind of the whole gamut of literature and clinical practice to come up with its updated guidelines. Uh, this is something that I learned when I was in residency. Uh, it's very easy. It's a pattern approach. You know, a high suspicion nodule is going to be solid, hypoechoic. It's going to have punctate echogenic foci. It's going to have irregular rim calcifications. Then you get into the intermediates and low suspicion, which you know may still warrant biopsy, but it'll have uh, higher thresholds. And then you have the very low suspicion and benign appearance. And um, it's not a grading system so much as it's pattern based. And a lot of radiologists, um, if you ask them, they would prefer this because it's a faster way to interpret. Um, but as mentioned before, and you probably are aware, there's a lot of uh, inter-reader observability or uh, variability, and you potentially could show the same nodule to the same reader two different days and get two different classifications. So that could be um, an issue for management. And then in terms of how these nodules would be worked up, if it was a high suspicion or intermediate suspicion pattern, FNA would be recommended at one centimeter, low suspicion, 1.5, very low suspicion, uh, two, and then a benign pattern wouldn't have an FNA. And this is true for adults. Uh, for children, the guidelines would be uh, you biopsy regardless of the size. You would, if it's a, anything that would be biopsied based on size criteria would be biopsied on children. That's just due to, um, a lack of data as far as I'm aware. Uh, 
ACR tie rads came out uh, with its guidelines in 2017. It took a different approach. Um, it looked at a imaging uh, appearance scoring system, um, recognizing that you know different features contribute to a different risk factor for malignancy. And so it's looking at the composition, the echogenicity, the shape, the margin, and then the presence of echogenic foci. And then those features are giving scores. Um, interestingly, for echogenic foci, you know, you could have multiple scores in it. And so you can have over seven points. And again, it's a sized based threshold for initiating biopsy based on the imaging features. Um, one thing that I just kind of want to editorialize, I don't like uh, ATA or TIRADS in that, you know, there are nodules where you'll say, you know, for example, you have a TR4 nodule, let's say it's eight millimeters. If you put a report out there that says it's moderately suspicious and it's below the threshold for even following, patient's going to be very concerned because you're saying they have something abnormal and you're not going to do anything about it. Similarly, if you have a, you know, a, something that's low suspicion or intermediate suspicion, but it doesn't meet the uh, threshold for biopsy, you know, patients are going to be concerned and, and that might actually cause them, you know, untoward anxiety or stress. And so I've actually had our radiologist uh, take the benign, not suspicious, mildly suspicious, mildly suspicious, highly suspicious language out. And instead, you know, whether using ATA or TIRADS, uh, or God forbid you're, you're scoring both, um, you would put, you know, the pattern or you put the score and then you put the recommendations. And then that way the patients see it and they, under they, they understand that, okay, this nodule doesn't need to be followed up or this nodule should be followed up uh, or this one should be biopsy, but they're not going to have, oh, well, the person reading it thinks it's cancer. And then kind of just to show my bias, um, there was a comparison study published in 2020 by Pendai et al. Um, they reviewed almost 2000 consecutive thyroid FNA from 2007 to 2016. So this was pre-ATA 2015, pre-ACR 2017. Um, and it was, you know, an era where we would FNA a lot more. And when they retrospectively applied ATA, uh, only 62% met criteria for FNA. And when they retrospectively applied TIRADS, about 32% met criteria for FNA. And the key takeaway from that work was that both grading systems had similar diagnostic accuracies. They had fair inter-rater agreement, not great, but fair. And that the false negatives between both grading systems were similar, 2.4% for ATA and 2.2% for TIRADS. And those are important, right? So the goal for a thyroid grading system would be you want to um, ensure you're biopsying and not missing cancers. So um, if one of them was, you know, if TIRADS was recommending, you know, half of the number of biopsies, but it had, you know, more than double of the false negatives, that would be, that would be, you know, black eye for the system, but instead they perform similarly. And so TIRADS recommendations would result in fewer immediate FNAs um, while still catching the same cancers. And so that's, that's helpful. And that was what pushed us to um, recommend formally for our readers that we would do TIRADS going forward rather than doing ATA or, or mixed ATA. Um, and, you know, as more data comes out, we'll revisit that question. So what's new in the literature? Well, Kabal et al published a um, very nice paper and they looked at the 728 biopsy thyroid nodules to determine if non-high suspicion calcifications or non-classifiable nodules under ATA altered the risk compared to just the grayscale features. Um, and they were defining it as macro calcifications or punctoechogenic foci non-hypocholic solid nodules. So that's something that you will also see in practice, the hyperechoic um, nodules with these little punctoechogenic foci or maybe even a spongiform nodule that's being misread or um, just on imaging doesn't look like a spongiform nodule. And, you know, they had no statistical, dis uh, no statistical difference in distribution of cytology compared to the classifiable nodules. Um, and the majority of the um, calcifications were macro calcifications over 90, 91%. And then the remaining were solid nodules with heterogeneous echogenicity. 
and then the presence of a complete circumferential rim. And Dr. Kowali kind of mentioned this, that there were just too few cases to make any generalizable points about rim calcifications. But their work did identify something. And I could say that anecdotally, I've found this to be true as well, that heterogeneous solid nodules have a higher rate of malignancy than you would expect. Um, Tyrads doesn't have a category for heterogeneous nodules. And you know the ATA criteria doesn't either. But when you're going to go to FNA and nodule and you see you know, a solid nodule and it's got kind of a band of hyperechogenicity and a band of hypoechogenicity and you sample it and you, you know, a lot of practices will have a cytopathologist with them and you look at the slides um, immediately after, the two areas have different um, cell types and it's helpful to sample both sides and oftentimes they will be malignant. Uh, whereas if you have the kind of standard benign appearing adenotoy nodule, it's solid and hyperechoic, um, that's not the case. So why does this work matter? So very low suspicious nodules um, under both ATA and ACR would not be referred for FNA. Um, ACR would say, don't follow them up. ATA would say, maybe follow them up or follow them up, maybe FNA if greater than two centimeters. Um, but under ACR tyrads, and this is a, a good case point, a cysting and solid hyperchoic isochoic knowledge nodule with macrocalcifications over one centimeter would be referred for FNA. And technically it'd be non-classifiable. Um, but this would, this would yield unwarranted FNA because the rate of malignancy is not significantly different uh, with or without these macrocalcifications. Um, and both groups have high benign rates. So instead of biopsying, you could just do watchful waiting. So going forward, you know, how do we incorporate this data? We really need to kind of distill which macro calcifications, if any, should be considered as a risk factor in future uh, versions of both ATA and TIRADS. Um, how do we incorporate subjective texture into future guidelines? It certainly should be, um, but you know, it's subjective. And we already have poor interreader variability or poor, yeah, poor interreader agreement. Um, and then this was touched upon, but can commercial machine learning or artificial intelligence refine who needs FNA, who can be followed and who can be reassured? I think if I'm an optimist, I say yes. A realist, I say no, um, not in the short term anyway. And the reason why is there's a lot of heterogeneity, heterogeneity in um, the equipment. It would most likely be a vendor specific package. So you would have, um, you know, if you're using a Philips machine, it would be a Phillips plugin. If you're using Siemens, it'd be a Siemens plugin. If it was uh, Canon or Toshiba, it'd be their plugin. Um, and it probably wouldn't have agreement between, you know, different platforms. And I think that you'd also have to consider the cost that it, it would not be free. Um, and ultimately, the reason why all this matters is to go back to, you know, the very first slide, we have to reduce unnecessary FNA while still catching the clinically significant thyroid cancers. Um, it's not economically feasible to biopsy every single thyroid nodule. I know we talk about a lot about you know patient harm and you know there is minimal risk to patients, um, but there's financial toxicity, there are staffing requirements, there's equipment requirements. You know if we've learned anything over these last two years is that um, you know supply chains are vulnerable and you know, some days you might run out of needles and some days you might run out of reagents. And um, if you're biopsying the nodules that need to be biopsied, you are helping prevent that um, versus, you know, anyone and everyone with a thyroid nodule gets an FNA. So with that, these are my references and we could open it up to questions. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Those were fantastic presentations. Um, I, I have to say that this uh, texture thing is, is also that uh, issue I face with when I'm in, uh, training my fellows or I'm seeing patients. I always say, these tend to be malignant, but I don't know why, and it's not reported. But the other thing is that I noticed that they are actually large nodules. They, they don't tend to be as small, they tend to be a little bit larger. Um, 
And the, the other thing, of course, is that sometimes Hashimoto's thyroiditis flavors a little bit of the of this texture analysis. But then, nevertheless, I think that is a fascinating finding because it has a lot of face validity uh, with what we see in practice. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Asadi, I, I think the one question, um, and I was fascinated about how you changed the reporting system, is that um, I do find that reporting system can have a significant impact in the conversation to follow when patients read this and they they, they read suspicious, high suspicious. Um, you, you mentioned some changes in your reporting system. What were those changes and how that does address some of the issues with patients reading these reports and per perhaps bringing some anxiety to the conversation and more biopsy because if they see something suspicious, they will be asking to do a biopsy. No, that's exactly right. So we dropped the the descriptive language, what the categories would have, right? So we wouldn't say that it's a very low suspicion, or we wouldn't say that it's moderately suspicious or high suspicious for tyrads. We would just say that this is a tyrads five nodule. Mm -hmm. And then at the bottom of the report, we would list the tyrads thresholds for follow-up at FNA, yep, yep. Um, both in reference, because I get that if you're an endocrinologist, you're going to be much more intimately familiar with thyroid nodule management, but we see referrals from, um, you know, non-endocrinologists, not head and neck surgeons, family practitioners, internal medicine, sometimes you see from cardiologists, it's just whoever, you know, it's seeing that patient and, you know, either palpates the thyroid nodules, working up a uh, thyroid issue, or, you know, had the unfortunate incidental thyroid nodule on imaging. And so we give them that criteria. And what we say is like, this is a, a grading system and that th these are recommendations and that they don't, they don't handcuff you to pursuing biopsy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at the same time, if there are other risk factors or reason to pursue biopsy, you certainly should. Um, and I find that that little bit of latitude is helpful because if you have, you know, you know, a 93 year old patient who's got a thyroid nodule, if you apply tyrads, it would say do a thyroid biopsy. But if you look at the kind of the bigger picture, it probably wouldn't make sense to do a thyroid biopsy in that patient. Whereas if you have a 30 year old, um, and, you know, they maybe had radiation therapy or, you know, they live in a high risk area. Um, you, you would pull the trigger a little earlier and pursue FNA. Um, but it really was prompted by, you know, patients calling up, um, their endocrinologist and saying, okay, why aren't you biopsying this nodule? Um, it's being read as suspicious. Even if you say mildly suspicious, you're still saying it's suspicious. Yes. And, that is not reassuring for you know lay person. If someone told you your your car had a mild chance of breaking down, you know would that mean anything to you? you would say oh, I'm going to take the mechanic and get it fixed. Um, and so you know, kind of recognizing the health illiteracy of the patients. Um, and that's not to say that you know there's something wrong with that. It's just making sure that they have an informed uh, understanding of what their thyroid nodules mean so they don't you know yep. they don't they're not unnecessarily stressed by no that's what i think and hopefully that comes through the the next sets of recommendations from acr i think that's that's great um uh, uh, dr kobali the the challenge with i think that the finding of macro calcifications with no other worries and features i think that that is a great addition to the practice i always I'm challenged with the ring calcification. And, and uh, the challenge is that all the literature is limited by the fact that the biopsy yield is quite low. It's very difficult to do biopsies on these nodules. You get stuck with the calci calcified rim. And either you do a, a core biopsy or just do a surgery to understand actually the malignancy. It's difficult to know what is under, under this calcified rim. Um, so in your study, how was, I think it was mostly biopsy and in some cases surgery, but what can you tell us about, more about it? Because I do find it still challenging to understand the risk of these patients with, I actually feel that they, they think the risk of cancer is not that high, but it's difficult to see what is underlying that. Yeah, and I didn't break this down, but in the in the non high suspicion calcifications, most of the most really weren't heavily rim calcified, and so mm. I think that it's a little hard to generalize that that group. Um, 
as far as the technical aspects of biopsying, I agree they're very challenging. We'll look for like an area we can like find our way through with the needle, use a heavier gauge, a lot of pressure to try to get through. And ultimately a lot of the times we, we don't have a, a clear answer, even if we try to do a biopsy. Um, sometimes diagnostic surgery, if the nodule's small, we'll just observe. It really depends a lot on patient preferences um, yep. as well. And I'm, I'm going to read some questions from the audience. One is about what happens with those macro calcifications that are in the parenchyma, not really part of thyroid nodules, but just find it isolated micro calcifications there. Do, do we see any risk of malignancy among those ones? Um, so maybe Dr. Rosati has an answer. I, I don't think an isolated macro calcification in the thyroid parenchyma is typically a cause for concern to my knowledge. One thing I'd be worried about is if you saw diffuse microcalcifications throughout the parenchyma, I know that can be associated with like diffuse sclerosing variant of papillary thyroid cancer. So that would be alarming to me. Um, I, mm -hmm. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> so it would, I don't know the risk factor, but I would just say if I were to have a case where I saw just a coarse calcification and background normal thyroid parenchyma, um, I wouldn't really give it more than an afterthought. I would describe and say there's a small micro calcification or not micro, but, you know, coarse calcification in the right lobe, maybe sequelae of prior injury and just leave it at that. Um, it's, it's not addressed with either uh, grading system. It wouldn't be something that I would approve for a biopsy. Um, I, agree. Yeah, I, I think yeah. just like Gestalt would be, it's a benign finding and move on. Yeah, that's also in our practice. What happens sometimes, these coarse calcifications, they, they are measured as a nodule. And sometimes they say, you know, there is a macro and, and they measure the shadow as yeah. part of the nodule. And then it's a 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and then it's high suspicion. And then it, that's a difficult conversation to have with patients. Yeah, but yeah. I agree. I, I don't think that there is any additional risk. Um, I think, uh, Dr. Asadi, you mentioned about, and then also you, Dr. Kovali, about the variability, uh, the integrated variability, uh, either because of the machine or because of the type of images that we get, uh, either the static images um, or sync images, and also the variability of who reads this one, endocrinologists versus radiologists or versus surgeons. The, the, this colleague is asking whether the studies actually also um, assess this variable of, of who is reading what? Did in our study or just in these studies? In general studies in, in regards to this um, thyroid uh, feature, uh, ultra and uh, nodule features for risk assessment. Do we have any, any impact of oh, who is reading this in regards to fields, endocrinology versus radiologists in terms of um, calibrating this? I don't know if that's been contrasted. I think most of the studies are done by, you know, either radiology or endocrinologists and typically people who have a lot of clinical experience because they're doing the research, but I, I don't, I've never seen like a direct head to head on, you know, radiology versus endocrinology. Um, and yeah, yeah, not that I'm aware of. I would say my experience with that is um, it would be a very challenging study um, a lot of the outpatient surgeons who are doing their own ultrasound, they are uh, limited either in the machine they have or in how they're able to save their images. So oftentimes they can take, you know, a printout and then they attach it to the patient's chart or if it's an EMR, they'll, you know, they'll scan it. Whereas, you know, in a radiology practice or endocrinology practice, you have a lot more resources and you're able to send those images into a, you know, picture archival system of PACS. Um, and so you would, my thing is, I don't think it's the reader so much as the issue. I think it's the equipment. You really do need to have high quality equipment that's well-maintained to get the truest representation of what the nodule is. Cause you can look at it with one machine and it appears one way. You could look at it with another, it'll look another. I'm sure if you took, um, one of those, um, you know, pocket ultrasounds that plug into your smartphone, you would get a completely different image than if you used a, you know, a standalone unit. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I think that's yeah. reassuring though, is in general, if you look at patients that are referred for biopsy, if anything, I think people overread things that aren't really suspicious. I've rarely seen a nodule that was like a clear concern that's no one's raised concern yeah. and recommended biopsy. So 
Perfect. And <laughs> just to correct, yeah, just to correct that the 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 colleague was asking about who 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 is uh, doing it, not who is reading it. But I think Dr. Asadi, you mentioned that the variability might also come from the machine that it's people machine. are using. Yeah. yeah, and this was great. Thank you very much for your time and a wonderful presentation. And building on this, actually, something that Dr. Asadi mentioned about machine learning, artificial intelligence, the challenges. So don't miss the next uh, journal club next week is actually a lecture that we'll be talking about that. And thank you very much for your um, attendance and your presentation. Thank you very much to the audience as well. Take care. Thank you.